Hi everybody, this presentation covers basic concepts of chemical bonding. In the next few slides we'll cover some key ideas and important concepts. We will examine how we can use the periodic table to determine the number of valence electrons for representative elements. We will discuss the formation of ionic bonds, also the formation of covalent bonds, and then finally we'll take a look at how we can use Lewis structures or dot diagrams to represent atoms, ions, and molecules. The representative elements belong to the S block and the P block of the periodic table. Uh, in order to determine the number of valence electrons for any representative element, we want to review electron configurations. For hydrogen, the electron configuration is 1s1. This means that hydrogen has one valence electron. Lithium has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s1. Uh, because lithium has one electron in the second level, it also has one valence electron. Uh, this will actually be true for any element in group 1. A, they will all have one valence electron. Elements in group 2A all have two valence electrons. Elements in group 3A have three valence electrons. Elements in the carbon family have four valence electrons. Elements in the nitrogen family all have five valence electrons. The oxygen family members have six valence electrons. Halogens have seven valence electrons. And the noble gases from neon down have eight valence electrons. Helium has only two, uh, but because they are in the first energy level, that energy level is completely filled and therefore it is very stable. Let's make some connections between valence electrons, Bohr models, Lewis structures, and orbital diagrams. Uh, let's remember that all alkali metals in group 1A will have one valence electron. This can be indicated by using a Lewis structure with a single dot representing the one valence electron. Uh, we see this for sodium and potassium. Halogens in group 7A have seven valence electrons, seven dots. Uh, now, let's make connections between Bohr models, Lewis structures, and orbital diagrams. Here's a Bohr model of a sodium atom. You can note that it has one electron in the third energy level. This is its valence electron. This Lewis structure cuts down on a lot of writing. We're just showing the single valence electron as a single dot here, which is indicating to us that we have one electron in the 3S sublevel. For a fluorine atom, uh, which has seven valence electrons. There are seven electrons in the second ring. We're indicating this with seven dots, and these dots are indicating the two electrons in the 2s sublevel and the five electrons in the three orbitals of the 2p sublevel. Ionic bond formation involves the transfer of electrons. Uh, this slide shows the formation of two different types of ionic bonds. In the sodium chloride compound, a sodium atom with a single valence electron will donate that electron to a chlorine, which originally has seven valence electrons. So the electron is X'd out here, being shown moving over to the chlorine. This causes the sodium to have a positive charge. The chlorine turns into a chloride ion with a minus one charge. And the electrostatic attraction of a positive and a negative charged particle will cause the two ions to stick together. Uh, for the formation of calcium chloride, here we're going to see a ratio of one cation to two anions because calcium, as an alkaline earth metal, has two electrons to donate. Each chlorine is capable of accepting only one electron. Uh, this causes the chloride ions to have a negative one charge, uh, and the two of them, both having a negative one charge, will balance the positive two charge uh, which was gained by the calcium when it gave up the two electrons. Covalent bonding involves the sharing of electrons, and this is going to be found both in molecules. Here we have an example of a molecule of ammonia. Here's an example of a molecule of carbon dioxide. This is also going to be found in polyatomic ions. For example, NH4+, which is called the ammonium ion, and SO3-2-, this is called the sulfite ion. Uh, to determine Lewis structures for both molecules and ions, we need to determine how many valence electrons each uh, element will contribute. So in ammonia, NH3, we have five valence electrons from the nitrogen. There's one atom, so we have a total of five valence electrons from nitrogen. 
Hydrogens each contribute one valence electron because there are three of them. We get a total of three electrons from hydrogens for a grand total of eight electrons in the molecule. The Lewis structure is shown here. And I've uh, attempted to, with the dots that are filled in or not filled in, indicate where the electrons came from originally. The unfilled in dots represent the electrons that nitrogen started with. The filled in dots represent electrons originally from the hydrogen atoms. So we can see between this hydrogen and this nitrogen, we're sharing a single pair of electrons, or two electrons are being shared. This is a single covalent bond. In the carbon dioxide molecule, we can determine a total number of 16 valence electrons, uh, which necessitates the formation of a double bond between the central carbon and both of the oxygen atoms that are bonded to the carbon. And we can see that this is going to lead to a full octet for each atom present in the molecule. This oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons with it. Same is true for the oxygen on the other side. The central carbon has four electrons here present in this double bond and four electrons present here in the other double bond. Uh, of note, with the ammonium ion, we need to, we would predict nine electrons, but we need to take one away in order to get the net charge of plus one. Uh, when we draw the structure, we can see that a hydrogen with no electrons may add on to this space, which is present on the ammonia molecule. Uh, we have a special name for this type of bond. It is called a coordinate covalent bond, indicating that both of the electrons that are shared between this nitrogen and this hydrogen originally belonged to the nitrogen. Also of note, square brackets are required as we write uh, Lewis structures for polyatomic ions, and the charge is going to be written as a superscript outside of the square brackets. Uh, we see the same thing being done here with the sulfite ion, which has a total of uh, 26 electrons, 24 for, for the electrons from sulfur and oxygen, plus an additional two electrons to give the minus two charge. So we can see here a valid Lewis structure for the sulfite ion. Electronegativity values will be used to determine if compounds are classified as being ionic, polar, or nonpolar covalent. And just as a reminder, you do have electronegativity values uh, available to you. They are on the back of your periodic table in the lower right corner on the reference side. Uh, so if we consider a compound like sodium chloride, the electronegativity difference between sodium and chlorine is 1.9. That, uh, I'm sorry, is greater than 1.9. The actual difference is 2.1. I'm finding this by taking the value for sodium, which is 0.9, and the value for chlorine, which is 3.0. So we're subtracting 0.9 from 3.0 to find that difference of 2.1. Uh, because that difference is larger than 1.9, this compound is classified as being ionic. Uh, polar covalent substances will have electronegativity differences between 0.4 and 1.9. Hydrogen chloride is going to have a difference of 0.9, uh, and hydrogen fluoride would have a difference of 1.9. Uh, please note that some references will indicate the cutoff is 1.7 as opposed to 1.9, and those sources would indicate that hydrogen fluoride is in fact an ionic substance rather than being covalent. It's really just a matter of preference. Uh, we will use the 1.9 value, but the reality is that a, a substance like hydrogen fluoride in certain situations can behave as a covalent material, and in other situations may behave as an ionic material. Uh, this symbol right here is uh, lowercase delta. It indicates that there is a dipole in this molecule um, where there is an uneven distribution of electrons within the molecule, and the electrons are going to spend more time on the side of the chlorine because it has a higher electronegativity. Uh, so this is going to make hydrogen chloride a polar molecule. Um, for nonpolar molecules, the electronegativity difference will be less than 0.4. Uh, again, some references will use 0.35 as the cutoff value. Uh, if we have a hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen atom, obviously this is going to be a nonpolar molecule that's being formed because the electronegativity difference would be exactly zero. Van der Waals forces are forces that exist between molecules, between one molecule and the molecules which neighbor that molecule. Uh, there are really two types of these. London forces are also called dispersion forces. These are the weakest of 
the Van der Waals forces, they're caused by temporary dipoles, uh, which are due to the random movement of electrons. Uh, we'll discuss the example of the halogens at the next slide. Dipole-dipole forces are stronger than London forces. These are due to uh, permanent dipoles, where we have partial positive and partial negative regions within molecules. Hydrogen bonding is a very specific type of dipole-dipole interaction that occurs when we have a hydrogen which is bonded to a very electronegative atom, for example, something like an oxygen. And we'll look at an example of this with a future slide as well. The random movement of electrons within molecules will ensure that every once in a while electrons are going to pile up more on one side of a molecule than the other side. This will create, for a, for a moment of time, a partial negative charge on that region of the molecule, which can induce a partial positive charge in a neighboring molecule, causing a momentary attract, attraction to occur between these molecules. Uh, please remember the discussion about dispersion forces and the states of matter for the halogens in including the gases, fluorine, chlorine, liquid, bromine, and iodine, which does exist as a solid. When iodine and chlorine bond together, there will be a dipole created because uh, there is a difference of 0.5 Pauling units in their electronegativity values. Chlorine will be the partial negative side, iodine will be the partial positive side, so we can see that neighboring molecules will be attracted to each other, and this is uh, what we call a dipole-dipole interaction. Hydrogen bonding is a very specific type of dipole-dipole interaction. Uh, to have hydrogen bonding, you must have hydrogen, which is bonded to a highly electronegative element such as chlorine or oxygen. Uh, when this occurs, we have an uneven sharing of electrons within the molecule, creating partial positive and partial negative regions. This causes neighboring molecules of hydrogen chloride to have a dipole attraction, so they'll stick together. Uh, similar interactions are found between water molecules. Um, and we'll note here, if we look at the water molecules, you'll see that the oxygen of one molecule will line up and be attracted to the hydrogen atom of neighboring water molecules. And this is, again, called hydrogen bonding. Another important learning objective is that students should be able to identify and differentiate shapes of binary molecules. Um, these are, uh, this information can be found in Chapter 6, Section 5 of your textbook. Uh, please note that your book, instead of using X, will use B uh, to represent peripheral atoms. Uh, we will discuss linear, bent, tetrahedral, trigonal pyramidal, and trigonal planar molecules. Um, students should, in the future, be able to, if given the uh, formula for a chemical compound, predict a Lewis structure for that molecule, determine what the shape would be, and then use electronegativity values to predict uh, whether or not the molecule is going to be polar. So let's look at some examples of shapes for different molecules. Uh, so if we examine carbon dioxide, we can determine that the uh, shape of this would be linear. Now how do we know that? Well, carbon is the central atom, so that's the A. O's, uh, the oxygens, are the peripheral atoms, so those are the X's or the B's, whichever you prefer. So this would fall in line with a molecule which is going to have a bond angle of 180 degrees. This is a linear molecule. Uh, water is going to have a bent structure because it will have the designation of A, oxygen, XX, so that's X2, and non-bonding pair plus non-bonding pair here will be AX2E2 for water, giving it a bent structure. Methane, CH4, will have the tetrahedral structure. Here we have our central carbon, that's the A, and four hydrogens, these are four X's, so AX4 gives a tetrahedral shape. Uh, NH4, I'm sorry, NH3, this is the um, molecule called ammonia. The designation for this will be AX3E. The shape of this particular molecule would be trigonal pyramidal. Finally, we have boron trichloride. Uh, we can see that this is an exception to the octet rule for boron having only uh, six electrons. The shape of this will be trigonal planar. In this final slide, we'll uh, look at some properties of metallic, ionic, and covalent substances. Uh, first, in bond formation, we know that ionic involves the transfer of electrons, covalent involves the sharing of electrons. In metallic, we have electrons moving between atoms. Types of elements, ionic, metallic, plus non-metallic elements. In covalent bonding, non-metallic with non-metallic. In, meta uh, in metal substances, of course, we have one metal or we have a combination of metals to give an alloy. 
physical state for ionic substances will be solids. In covalent, we're dealing with solids, liquids, or gases, depending on what's the weight of the molecule and how strong are intermolecular attractions, how strong are the van der Waals forces. Metals are going to be solids with the, with the exception of mercury, which is a liquid. Melting points, high for ionic and metallic, uh, lower for covalent, solubility in water, high, uh, high to low, d uh, depending on polarity, not soluble here, conductivity and boiling point, we can read those values.